So, uh, first let me say that if you use the chat, I um, always read everything that's come in, sometimes a little, a little after our formal ending, but I'm just not able, of course, to respond to everything in it. If you do use the chat, please focus on your own practice, your own experience, and avoid, oh, criticizing, lecturing, persuading, or selling other people. Focus on your own practice, your own experience. Uh, all right, so I'm glad you're here, and uh, welcome at the tail end of in much of the Northern Hemisphere, at least, uh, the end of this year, elsewhere, too, in the world. And I want to explore with you an absolutely fundamental and even radical teaching from the Buddha that has a lot of implications. So to enter into this, uh, you may know that the Buddha taught that um, <clears throat> existence has three characteristics. Now, to some extent, for sure, those characteristics apply to our psychological existence. And they apply to much, certainly, of reality itself. The first characteristic, well, actually, I'll say the, the words in Pali. You may recognize them. Anicca, dukkha, and anatta. Anicca is impermanence. All that is subject to arising is eventually subject to passing away. Things change. As I said at the, you know, at the, earlier on today, um, almost everything falls apart eventually, one way or another. This is the truth of change. <clears throat> Second, dukkha. Dukkha, which is the first noble truth, by the way, is routinely and significantly mistranslated as suffering. The Buddha never said life is suffering. Dukkha is, has to do with three things. The first is that pleasant experiences um, do end. All right, that's true. That which is subject to arising is subject to passing away. The pleasure of eating a donut or seeing a beautiful sunset or truly enjoying your company, myself, tonight, the pleasure in all of that will eventually end. That's sim simply a fact of psychological existence. Second, there are sometimes unpleasant experiences, sometimes horribly unpleasant, agonizing, terrible, physical, emotional pain. Sometimes that happens. That's a second aspect of dukkha. The third aspect of dukkha relates to anatta, which I'll get to in a moment, which is that everything exists in relationship to everything else so that there is no um, stability or central solidity in anything. Everything exists relationally, which when you really burrow into it, you get the feeling that there is nothing fundamentally substantial anywhere. In other words, there's no basis for uh, permanent happiness based on, based in changing conditions. That's the third aspect of dukkha. Now, if you look really closely, there is nothing inherently suffering in dukkha. Yes, unpleasant experiences occur, but they too often change, and they're not the entirety of existence. Second, pleasant experiences change. All right, but that's not inherently suffering as long as we don't hold on to them. And the fact that unpleasant, pardon me, the fact that pleasant experiences can change also enables unpleasant experiences to change. And further, even if a pleasant experience changes, maybe on the heels of it will come another pleasant experience. No inherent suffering there. And also last, the fact that everything is relational and dynamic and 
changing is not itself suffering either, as long as it were at peace with that fundamental fact. Which then takes us to the third characteristic, anatta. And here, the Buddha was arguing against the notion of his time of some kind of um, eternal soul entity that was independent of changing conditions. And that was called in India at the time, Atman. So Anatta means not Atman in the narrow sense. More broadly, Anatta points to what in English is often translated as emptiness or the lack of um, some sort of solid center or substance that has absolute self-existence. This point about the absence of absolute self-existence, um, absolute solidity or, st or stability, applies to our psychological sense of selfhood. If we allow our experiences of selfing to be dynamic, to be changing, to arise, to pass away, no problem. It's when we presume that there actually is some kind of contracted, solidified, essentialized, unified, enduring, independent entity in others or in ourselves, that's when we create a lot of suffering and harm. Now, all of these characteristics are to be explored and experienced and not taken on faith alone. Simply put, things change, anicca, impermanence. Simply put, Conditions that change are not themselves a basis for permanent, uh, ultimate, highest happiness. And in all of this, uh, we cannot find any kind of absolute, primary, um, absolutely self-arising center of anything. These are the three characteristics. Um, they can be described in different ways. Some people maybe are more articulate than I am about them, but that's the essence of the matter. The takeaway from all three of these characteristics is that, in effect, the first of two truths that I'll be exploring with you tonight, that almost everything falls apart eventually. Bodies fall apart. Planetary systems fall apart. Species go extinct. Relationships break up. Uh, businesses fail or transition into something else. Um, leaves fall, right? Children leave home. Roles that we had change as we age. What's appropriate Conditions that are appropriate when our children are six years old are not appropriate when they're 36 year olds, 36 years old. Things fall apart. Everything, almost everything, almost everything falls apart eventually. And so much of practice, whether it's in clinical psychology, my own professional background, or in the Buddha Dharma, or in just everyday practical wisdom, so much of, of life is about dealing with the fact that things fall apart. Things fall apart. How do we be with all that? How do we practice with it? How do we be brave and bold and compassionate in the face of things falling apart? How do we not give in to despair? One way, obviously, is to appreciate all that is in the present moment, even as the present moment falls apart into the next moment that's arising continuously. Things continually fall apart, and new things continually arise. Leaves fall, and come the spring, new buds appear. 
also, second, <clears throat> some things endure. All the good, for example, that you accomplished this year will never not have happened. Yeah, some of the things you may have accomplished this year were transient, you know, like the dishes that you did soon replaced tomorrow by dirty di new dirty dishes. On the other hand, the good intentions that you've had in the past year, the love that you expressed, the sincere efforts you made, the steps you took, the stands you took for a better world, the ways you stood up for some people and some causes and some truths. Whatever building blocks you laid down in your career, your work, your home, that will never not have happened. It will always have happened. In that sense, it will always endure. Also, what endures, at least in the present, is um, what is good in our relationships. Uh, I don't know if you know any particular person who's here on a Wednesday will be here next Wednesday, but it is enduring, isn't it? This sense of community and practice together that we have with each other. That endures, doesn't it? If you have friendships with others in your life, relationships, in the present, that which is good in those relationships is here. It's enduring. You can count on it. In yourself, in your own being, awareness endures, doesn't it? Certainly, in the life of this body, awareness endures. What else endures? Does your fundamental integrity in this life endure? The fact that you're a fundamentally decent, fair-minded person who, maybe with a little grumbling if you're like me, can gradually see the light and can gradually admit you know, fault and uh, implement correction and aim toward a higher road, right? Those qualities in you endure. What else endures in this life, certainly? Like your appreciation of beauty, your enjoyment of music, you know, your movement to be kind, right? All that endures. And the more that we face the radical truth of impermanence, the radical fact that, as the Tibetan proverb puts it, um, eventually, one way or another, each of us will be separated from all that we love. The more that we open into that truth and find a way to be at peace with it, that things do fall apart, including this particular life. The more uh, open and clear seeing we get about that, the more important it is to find refuge in what does endure. So I really invite you to um, allow yourself to recognize change the change that has happened over the past year and the change that will occur in the year to come changes. Things will keep changing. And in the midst of all that, what can you take refuge in that does endure? In the chat, if you like. You might want to put in things that for you are enduring, certainly in this life. I'd like to add 
um, some for your consideration. So certainly over a very long span of time, the mountains endure. Over a very long period of time, um, forests endure. Yes, there are changes, some of them human-made, tragically, and still um, the ocean endures, keeps on going. Nature endures. The species within nature and the organisms within individual species, those gradually tend to change over time. But life as life has endured on this planet for over three billion years through many, many, many challenging conditions. And in one form or another, life on this planet will endure. Most fundamentally, though, I want to draw your attention to, in some ways, the heart of the Buddha's teaching, which has to do with his own personal journey. You may know that um, he was born a fairly wealthy uh, male baby uh, into privilege in his time. Uh, he, he lived in relative comfort 2,500 years ago in what is now northern India. Uh, approaching his 30th birthday, somewhere in his late 20s, he was married and um, his wife had or was about to have a child. And in the midst of all those conditions, he, for whatever reason, decided to leave home to abandon his uh, wife and child in the context of the time of the extended family they'd, they'd be cared for within, but still fundamental leave-taking. And he went forth into homelessness, seeking the highest, most enduring happiness. Perhaps literally, probably metaphorically, it is said that uh, what prompted him to make such a radical change was an encounter with what are called the four heavenly messengers or divine messengers, uh, which were first someone who was aging and, you know, with high and for me completely implausible drama, it is said that somehow the young Siddhartha was kept inside the, the castle, as it were, um, all his life, and he was kept away from any evidence of any pain or discomfort. Completely unrealistic. But in any case, uh, the first messenger is someone who is aging, aging. And these are messengers from the divine, from the God, supposedly. These are great teachers. Yes, there is aging. Second messenger, yes, there is illness. Third messenger was a corpse. Yes, there is death. All examples that most things fall apart eventually. And the fourth messenger was someone who was deeply centered in personal practice, psycho-spiritual practice. Calm, peaceful, content, content amidst the things that fall apart. And so the Buddha went forth looking for that kind of highest happiness. And then after, during his training, six, seven or so years of training of various kinds, he pursued many teachers. He did extremely intensive practice, nearly to the point of death, as best we can gather from the surviving records of his time. And he got to a point where he was really adept in various meditative attainments. But no matter how high the meditative attainment, in which his teachers of the time said, oh yeah, you're as far along as I am, you, you, you got this, each one of those meditative attainments eventually fell apart because they too were subject to arising and thus subject to passing away. All that is subject to arising is subject eventually, over some time span, to falling away. And so the Buddha kept looking. He kept looking for what is not 
subject to arising and therefore not subject to passing away. In other words, what is eternally present in which each of us can take our fundamental stand in what truly is enduring, ultimately enduring. And so um, he uh, encountered nirvana. What exactly that means, people argue about. My reading of what um, he said he encountered and my reading also of, or my experience really, of what is actually true is that an ultimate kind of um, unconditioned timelessness, not conditioned, and therefore not subject to passing away, not in time, and therefore not subject to passing away, some kind of unconditioned timelessness, which for him was the highest happiness, the ultimate, unshakable, stainless peace, the farthest shore not subject to passing away, deathless as a result. The basis fundamentally for the highest happiness. Over time, as we both deepen in our wisdom practices with what changes, what falls apart. We open to it, we enjoy it, and we hold it more and more lightly. So much of the Buddha Dharma, most of the words in the very extensive Pali canon, Pali being a language, a key language of early Buddhism, canon being the uh, earliest surviving written record. It's a lot of words, you may know it. These are, if you put the book side by side in a good English translation, it's about that wide. Compare that to the actual statements uh, attributed to Jesus uh, in the, the, the four Gospels in the New Testament, uh, which really, if you just cut them out, as Thomas Jefferson, our third president in America did, uh, would fill just a handful of pages. You know, I'm not saying the Buddha Dharma is better or worse per se. I'm just giving you a sense of how much there is, the quantity of it. Most of that is about how to practice with the first truth that most things fall apart eventually. How do we bring you know, wise um, understanding, wise intentions, wise speech, wise action, wise livelihood, wise meditation, et cetera, et cetera, moral conduct? How do we cultivate uh, a mind and a body that is, increasing, that is less and less engaged in the habit of craving, of chasing after that which is changing and slips through our fingers even as we try to grasp it? So much practice is about ways of um, finding peace uh, with that which is changing, including practices that are very, very heart-centered, that involve compassion and kindness and relationship with others. Right? So much of uh, both Buddha Dharma and also modern psychology, coaching, counseling, clinical practice, Certainly other traditions in the world, certainly the you know, uh, humanities, certainly the wisdom of the people of the First Nations, um, is very much about this fundamental matter of how to deal with the fact that stuff falls apart. You don't live forever. Uh, yeah. Additionally, though, there are fundamental teachings, which are also found in the world's traditions, it's also found in the Buddha Dharma, definitely found in the evolution of Buddhism through Tibet and then through Chan in India and then Zen in Japan, uh, all Pure Land, and then moving now into kind of Western, um, often secular forms. Uh, as Buddhism evolved, there was, there's been a growing foregrounding of what was maybe in the background 
in the early teachings, which is the vital importance of finding and taking refuge in that which endures. Notably, unconditioned timelessness, timelessness, which may also have qualities of awareness and even love. How can we do that? The foregrounded teaching in early Buddhism is that we encounter unconditioned timelessness in a kind of breakthrough experience in which there's a cessation of ordinary conditioned consciousness, typically as the result of very deep and uncommon meditative training. Cessation leading to nirvana, and then a return that is illuminating. Whatever might be available about that, those, those breakthrough experiences of cessation or different kinds of breakthrough experiences into a radical falling away of the sense of self and a radical immersion in uh, all that is, in what in Zen is called Kensho or Satori, and more broadly are called you know, non-dual experiences, radically non-dual experiences, or in the technical psychological term, self-transcendent experiences in which the sense of self falls away and the world shines forth in radiant perfection. Whether we have those kinds of breakthrough fireworks experiences or not, meanwhile, really happily, and very much my encouragement to you, is to gradually become more permeable to unconditioned timelessness, perhaps infused with awareness and love, and to have moments of awakening many times a day, as the proverb puts it in Tibet, in which there's a gradual, almost thinning of the conventional ego mind, and it becomes more and more lacy, more and more open, more and more untangled, and more and more rested in that which endures. You may find that which endures outside of yourself in various conditions, but they too will eventually pass away, certainly most of them. You may find what endures. And, and by the way, that's important to find what endures out in the world to the extent that's meaningful to you. I take great comfort in the oceans and the mountains and the sky and in nature altogether. Um, find what endures in your relationships, find what endures in your own heart. These are all beautiful, really, really important things. And most of them, one way or another, will pass away. Meanwhile, what for you is fundamentally timeless? You might have a sense of the timelessness in which time flows. You might have a sense of a kind of unconditioned ground of possibility in which or out of which conditioned reality keeps emerging and changing. You might have a sense that your own individual awareness in its depths opens out into something that's transpersonal, very quiet and accessible. You might have a sense of that. You might have a sense of mystery, if nothing else, mystery that contains or is a space in which actuality occurs. Maybe that's it. And here too, we have the great teachings of so many traditions, including Buddhism, about taking your stand, finding your seat in that which does not rust, that which is not conditioned, that which is not subject to arising and passing away. And if that does exist, and it's 
utterly the teaching of the Buddha that it does, and it's utterly my own experience and that of many, 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 many other beings, including perhaps yourself. If that does exist, it is your own nature, here and now. The fundamental ground of unconditioned timelessness must be your own ground as well. And it's quite remarkable to experience both, to experience being a conditioned body-mind process that's here for a while and will pass away at the same time as having a sense of unconditioned timelessness. That's available to us. That's available to us, even without uh, total breakthrough experiences, even without complete irrevocable awakenings. We can all be works in progress in which we hold our conditioned body-mind process increasingly lightly and with tenderness and great gratitude for the life that we've been given, even amidst its pains and sorrows. We can practice in those ways which also help us become increasingly rested in and available to and able to stay in touch with that underlying ground of unconditioned timelessness, which is our ultimate refuge. Especially when things fall apart. So you might consider what your own experiences are of both practicing with impermanence, practicing with the transient falling apartness of most phenomena. What's your practice with that? How have you been growing in practice, hopefully over the past year? And how might you continue to grow in practice in the year to come? Um, one thing that helps me uh, do this is embedded in the teaching from T.S. Eliot, teach us to care and not to care. And I'm someone who, I may have said this, I think, actually, recently, I, I tend to care too much. <laughs> in a sense, I'm not apathetic <laughs> or, you know, blasé, you know. Uh, I, you know, I see things that, that seem to matter and I'm like a, you know, I don't know what to call it. I'm like a bloodhound on the on the trail. I want to I want to help it happen. I want to help it happen, and I have am having to learn, especially as I kind of age, uh, that you know it's important to allow caring to occur, while not getting contracted or pressured or driven or pushy about it. You know how to rest in compassion for suffering, while not getting you know, too overwrought uh, or, you know, driven, pressured, bossy, pushy, and so forth about ways to relieve suffering. That's, that's important for me to take on board. I'm declaring myself to you here. Uh, it's important for me to take on board in the year to come. So you might consider what's important for you to take on board, to commit to, to support yourself with, you know, wisdom practical, day-to-day, -day, relational, embodied, in your body wisdom about things falling apart, having the nature of falling apart. And also, over the past year, looking back, what has helped you become more open to, more in touch with, whatever for you is enduring, including ultimately enduring? And in the year to come, how do you want to help yourself be more in touch with what endures, less caught up in what changes, and even more in touch with the underlying ground of everything, which by definition is enduring. Things change, but their ground, the ground of things doesn't change, the ultimate ground of things. What would help you? Rest more and more deeply in it.
if I could make mention of something, um, one thing that really helps me, and I think it helps oodles and oodles and oodles of people, you know, in other words, that's a big number, an oodle, many oodles, right? One thing that really helps me, and I think I can, yes, indeed, paste it in here, is the sense of common cause with others, the sense of coming together. Uh, when I look out at uh, things that have changed or are, are changing for the worse, like the climate uh, around the world, um, it gives me a sense of hope and it eases my own suffering to feel like, well, I'm joining in common cause with many others who are doing something about it. So I just put a notice in the chat um, that you can see and others maybe can copy and paste it further down in the chat as you know, as we keep going here. Um, you know, an event I'm doing tomorrow for the Global Compassion Coalition that I've helped to found, found, helped to establish with some other people. And I really encourage you to come to this event or register for it, or tell other people about it. Basically, it'll be a an hour of focus on resting and renewing. It's been a tough year for a lot of us, me included. And, um, you know, as we come into the year to come, as we enter into the year to come, it's helpful to find rest and renewal and a sense of camaraderie, common cause with others. We need to be, you know, the more people we are, the stronger we are, right? We're stronger together. And the bigger we are, the stronger we can be to actually drive the systemic change that the world needs to change structural, long-standing sources of suffering that are grounded, most of them, in historic forms of injustice. So anyway, I hope you'll come. I hope you join me. Uh, it'll be good. Uh, it'll be in about 12 hours from now, <laughs> closer to 13. I'll try to preserve my voice until then. And anyway, I just really hope you'll uh, check it out. Okay. So there are, we have these two things that are, all this changes and therefore falls apart while this endures. How do we deal with what changes while resting in what endures? That's what we're exploring tonight. The global event tomorrow is at 9 a.m. Pacific time wherever that might be for the rest of you. We'll record it as well, so you can register for it, tell other people about it, which I'd appreciate. And even if you can't be there for the live portion, which will include me responding to questions. Um, if you can't be there for, for the live portion, um, you'll be able to see it later. Okay, let me just take a peek at some of the wonderful comments. I hope you have a, had a chance, maybe if it's been helpful to you, to uh, take a look at the um, chat, so many good things here. Wow. Okay, great. I'm unfortunately going to have to um, to not respond to everything. So, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. <coughs> I was sucking on a little lozenge that both helps my throat, but then it decomposes because the lozenge falls apart eventually, uh, and um, then it creates something that catches in my voice box. Anyway, so Dana, Dana Zed, at 54 minutes past the hour, she challenged, in effect, is asking when I said almost everything. Well, everything doesn't fall apart. In other words, that which, whatever is eternal, it endures. It doesn't fall apart, by definition. The reason I hedged it slightly in the almost is because I'm kind of a geek and I'm not sure the speed of light changes. I'm not sure the fundamental constants that are the parameters of the physical universe like Planck's constant and some other things. I'm not sure they fall apart. And the fact that um, certain things have happened, the factuality of them doesn't change. In other words, um, the fact that humans have walked on the moon will not change. It will always be the case that humans 
have walked on the moon. Um, certain things that uh, you know we've done, certain stands that we've taken, moral stands, uh, you know, those will always have been true. Then that will not fall apart. So I'm just kind of. You know, I'm I'm very I, I try to be pretty careful in how I speak, Dana. So I'm that's why I'm kind of slightly hedging that. But most things do fall apart eventually. You know, certainly within ordinary reality. Okay, let's see if there's another question or comment. Lots of wonderful comments. Again, I really encourage you. What's your practice in the coming year? What will support you in dealing with the mess of life? You know. People leave home. People estrange from others. Uh, children stop calling. Uh, you know, the some trees you've planted wither and pass away. Uh, you may know um, the teaching from the great Zen master Yunman, who was asked, what is it that, you know, leaves fall and trees wither? He said, body exposed in the golden wind. That's reality. How do we live with our exposure in the golden wind? And what will help you in the coming year to rest more and more in what is not subject to arising and passing away? How can you take your stand in the deathless increasingly? Oh. Okay, let's see. Yeah. I've had good intentions toward you all. This year, and everyone that you all includes, I've had good intentions. And it will always be true that I have had good intentions toward you. You too have had good intentions. It will always be true that you have, that you had had good intentions over the past year. That's a refuge. Beautiful. Beautiful comments. Um, uh, it's up two minutes past the hour. iPhone, whoever that is, says, oops, uh, but, but love endures even after our loved ones pass away. Yeah. I've had people in my extended larger family system distance themselves from me. And, um, you know, my love for them in the past will always have been the case. And the fact that I still have love for them in the present will always have been the case. Yeah, love endures. Great. All right, beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you for the kindness that's kind of coming to me. Your kindness toward me will always have been the case. I want to call out Jenny P's comment at 15 minutes past the hour, some poetry in it, but really got me here. Permeable to transparencies of open, enduring love for all beings. We have a deep longing and recognition of love for life itself. How slowly do rocks think? That's a fine piece of poetry. Okay. Ah, Erica writes, I have a sense of a part of me I have no name for. Exactly. Exactly. You know, that which endures is ultimately beyond language. You know, language passes away. Language is constructed. Language is partial. Language is conceptual. Right. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. So, I want to Thank you for putting the link in for the this rest and renewal hour of practice we'll be engaged in tomorrow. And um, I think that's good. Okay, excellent. Well, it's 30 minutes past the hour. I hope you enjoyed the ride. I'm so sorry, Terry. I just am not going to be able to respond. I see you there. Thank you, though. Um, I hope you enjoyed the ride. Maybe a lot of words, maybe too many words for me. Whew. Stuff changes. How do we be with that? With an open heart, with 
with compassion for ourselves and loyalty to ourselves and compassion and loyalty to others. With insight into the changingness of things. With understanding that if we get caught up in craving, it creates suffering and harm. Right? And meanwhile, how can you rest in this coming year? Whatever for you is stainless, rustless, trustworthy, reliable, count honorable, a true refuge, both enduring things that are very slow to change in this life such as a, the knowing of your own goodness, your own sincerity, your own good heart. What a refuge. So important. Knowing and, and giving over to the love arising within you. That's reliable. And ultimately, to the extent you have a sense of it, you know, unconditioned timelessness in the ground of all. So thank you so much for your kindness and attention. I may see you tomorrow uh, at this uh, event for the Global Compassion Coalition. I hope you tell all your friends. I hope you join it. Uh, the more people we are, the stronger we are, and the bigger we are, uh, the stronger we are to drive positive, oh, long overdue change. Meanwhile, I'm bringing tonight to a formal end. <laughs>